Hey, thanks for joining us for part one of our life group leader training. We believe that when the leader gets better, everybody gets better. Uh, we're going to talk in the next little bit of time about two things. We're going to talk about our life group leader philosophy and the dark sides of small group or life group leading. And so I want to start off with some philosophy. Here's a thought for you that you can write down. Most leaders stress over the right strategy. The best leaders seek to develop the right people. So what's primary for us is not building the healthiest uh, strategies, organization, and culture. What we want to do is we want to bring on the right people that naturally leads to uh, the healthiest strategies, organization, and culture. So if we can bring the, bring the best people around the table, those A-plus leaders, we believe that that's going to lead to the healthiest structure and organization and culture. So, uh, in fact, Jessica Heron says that shaping your culture is more than halfway done once you hire your team. I love that. Let's say it one more time. Shaping your culture is more than halfway done once you hire your team. So the fact that you're listening to this right now, the fact that you're watching this uh, says a lot about you, says that you want to grow, that you want to take your leadership seriously. Uh, we're going to be looking at the philosophy of small group leading, and then we're going to go right into the dark sides of um, small group or life group leading. And so here's our life group philosophy. Okay, here's our life group philosophy. Okay, in a small ministry, discipleship is a lot easier to do in a group of people like that. So we love life groups. Something that Pastor Tom says all the time is that uh, life happens in small groups or life groups. And so in a large ministry, the larger the ministry becomes, the larger the church becomes, the smaller we have to get. That's the, that's the heart of lead small. The larger our church gets, the larger our congregation gets, the larger our membership gets, the larger whatever. Maybe you're a CEO, maybe you work in a business, maybe you're a guy who works in finance. The larger a business gets, it has to get smaller as well. So as our ministry grows, we want to get smaller as a result. So the majority of our discipleship efforts are actually done through life group models. Um, and so we care a lot about culture here. And, and so here's a thought for you if you're taking notes. Any healthy leader knows that their ministry's success isn't just dependent on the vision, but the people who are carrying out the vision. And so uh, Simon Sinek, who uh, wrote, write a, wrote a book called um, Start With The Why, said this. He said, customers will never love a company unless the employees love it first. I love that. Let me say it one more time. Customers will never love a company unless the employees love it first. Okay? There's a reason why so many of us are attracted to the greatest chicken sandwich around, which is Chick-fil-A, and it's because their customers are so bought into how much their organization and their company enjoys what they do. Now, now, the philosophy of actually leading a life group, we're going to get into that today. And so if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down. We're going to have a graphic for you to look at. And that graphic was de developed by a guy named Benjamin Bloom. And it's something that we call Bloom's Taxonomy. And this was helped develop to show how people best learn in a life group setting. Write this down if you're taking notes. A good life group leader can be viewed as a facilitator of a guided discussion. I'm going to say it again. Write this down. A good life group leader can be viewed as a facilitator of a guided discussion. Our goal isn't to talk 90% of the time, but rather to facilitate our members of our life group talking 90% of the time. We want to facilitate the conversation. We want to speak about 10% and let them speak about 90. We don't simply want to call people to remember facts, but challenge and inspire them to create and evaluate truth that's based on the Bible. So as you look at Bloom's taxonomy, something you can see in the lowest level is something called remembering facts. And remembering facts is what we do so often. We'll sit in a, in a life group setting and we'll just say, hey guys, remember that God loves you. Well, actually what Benjamin Bloom discovered was that the highest form of cognitive learning and development was actually something called creation and analyzation. And it's the highest form of cognitive learning, and that happens through guiding a facilitated conversation around a specific bib biblical truth. So let me give you an example. Instead of saying, hey, God loves you, remember that. Instead, a better way to go would be to say, hey, who's someone in your life that loves you a lot? And someone might say, I don't know, my mom or my dad or my aunt or my uncle or my nephew or someone that loves me really well. And then you would say, okay, well, what about the way they love you really sticks out to you? And they might say things like, well, they care about me a lot. They go out of their way for me. They want to serve me. They're about me. They're for me. Yeah, that's awesome. A, a follow-up question that might be like, where do you think they learned about love? Well, maybe their parents, or maybe their aunt or uncle, maybe their grandparents. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe. Where did those people learn about it? Well, I don't know, maybe from their pastor. Okay. Where do you think their pastor learned about love to teach them? Well, probably from the Bible. Yeah. Who wrote the Bible? Well, God did. It's God's word. Yeah. So couldn't we also say that God is the one who authored love? Yeah. 
Or in other words, God is love, right? God is love. So you see the difference there. Instead of just saying God's love, remember that, which is what we do very, very often in school, university, we, we actually facilitated a conversation towards a specific end goal that led someone to believe that, that they created that truth for themselves, that God is love. And we did that through guiding them through the Bible and through asking good open-ended questions. Okay, so again, we, we don't want to simply call people to remember facts. We want to challenge and inspire them to create and evaluate truth that's based in the Bible. Okay, uh, write this down if you're taking notes. Know your end goal before you start your life group. Know your end goal before you start your life group. I love what R Leonard Ravenhill says in his book, Why Revival Tarries. He says, without vision, the people perish. I love that. I'll say that one more time. Without vision, people perish. And it goes to show that direction and, and knowing your end goal is extremely important when leading a life group. If you guys are taking notes, write this down. Be the type of leader that people get to follow, not the type of leader that people have to follow. That's so huge when it comes to life group leading and good leadership. Be the type of leader that, leader that people get to follow, not the type of leader that people have to follow. Okay? So that's a little bit of our philosophy. Okay? So Bloom's Taxonomy, we don't want to be those who just call people to remember facts. We want to challenge them and inspire them to create and evaluate truth for themselves through a guided, open and facilitated conversation that leads them towards a specific end goal, a specific end goal. So, so we talked about a little bit about that, and now we're going to get into some dark sides of life group leading, okay? Now, before we get into this, I want to say that most people usually have a strong weakness, usually followed by a couple other ones that may, they may be able to see in their own leadership. But we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, the fact that rarely is anyone ever a perfect leader. And so the reason we're having this training, the reason you might be watching this right now at your computer or on the TV in your living room or with a group of people is because you want to go deeper in your leadership and you want to know how. Well, we want to equip you to do that. But the first thing sometimes in getting better is recognizing where we fail, our faults, and the ways we need to get better. And so we have four types of dark sides that I'm going to talk about right now in this portion of time. And then uh, part two, Tom is going to get into um, the, the type of leader we're wanting to build. So we're going to share about four dark sides of life group leading. The first dark side is the passive leader, the passive leader. If you're taking notes, that's the first type of dark side, the passive leader, okay? Write this down. The passive leader creates disengaged followers. I'll say it one more time. The passive leader creates disengaged followers. Here's a thought if you're taking notes. An immature, insecure leader often mistakes control for leadership. I'll say that one more time. An immature, insecure leader often mistakes control for leadership. These leaders don't try to be the leader that's sought after, uh, but rely on their position as what will make their followers listen to them. These leaders don't try to be the leader um, that, that, that is strong-headed and, and gung-ho. Uh, typically, this person is very passive in their leadership style. The passive leader may be faithful about being in the group consistently, but they don't care too much about the day-to-day -day and staying up with the people that they're involved with in their life group. Uh, typically, if an answer is wrong, there won't really be any follow-up. And, and sometimes silence guys can communicate to a person in your life group that what they said was right, even if it was totally wrong. And so these leaders may be nor, more uh, non-confrontational. They don't really like confrontation and disagreeing. And, and, and here's a thought if you're taking notes. You cannot fix what you're not willing to confront. I'll say that one more time. You cannot fix what you're not willing to confront. And so these leaders are typically insecure about themselves or their abilities, and therefore they think that their followers don't want to follow them because they don't believe they're really worthy enough to be followed in the first place. And you might be in the living room or at your kitchen table or at your desk right now, and you might be like, man, Grant, I see a lot of myself in a passive life group leader. Uh, I am a passive life group leader. And that's the purpose of this time as we keep going through these dark sides is for you to go, okay, what am I? Where are the dark places in my heart that I need to give to Jesus in order for him to work out of me so that I can be the best leader I can? Because remember, uh, when the leader gets better, everybody gets better. We all benefit from self-development, okay? Here's the second type of dark side, if you're taking notes, of a life group leader. The dominating leader or the dominator, okay? Um, so the second type, again, is the dominator. The first type is the passive leader. The second type is the dominator. The dominating leader creates, write this down, helpless or disengaged followers. I'll say that one more time. The dominating leader creates helpless or disengaged followers. These leaders love control and they don't realize how much they show it. Um, and in a life group, write this down. This is a thought for you for free. You can have either growth or control, but you cannot have both. I'll say it one more time. You can either have growth 
or control, but you cannot have both. Instead of talking 10% of the time and allowing the people in your life group to talk 90, these leaders typically talk 90% of the time or maybe even more and, uh, and allow for less than 10% to the people around them. Uh, these leaders usually lack self-awareness about how much they talk. These leaders usually love rabbit trails. Uh, these leaders think they're good listeners, but actually uh, they've already kind of mapped out the rest of the life group in their head. And so they're not really concerned about what's being said because they already have a mental map of where they're going to go. Um, these types of leaders are often accused of being bad listeners, even if they think they're doing a great job. These leaders um, rarely affirm or give feedback because they're on to the next thing in their life group. And these leaders ultimately can sometimes communicate a lack of care. And so we need to be careful that we're not the dominating leader. So for, again, number one was the passive leader. Number two was the dominating leader. And now we're into the third dark side if you're taking notes, which is the preacher, the preacher. And uh, a lot of us that are watching this video right now, you're going to be the preacher. Maybe you grew up in the South. Maybe you grew up in Sunday school culture. And you just picture leading a life group as I've got to teach these people Maybe what the pastor just said, but I've got to reiterate or reform it in my own words to make it more impactful. And this is what the preacher creates in their followers. If you're a preacher and you lead a life group, this is what you create. They create insulted or bored followers. Insulted or bored followers. Instead of focusing on opening the discussion, they reteach the material in their own way. This type of leader lacks self-awareness and knowing that the material was just shared. Maybe you watched a video, maybe you watched something on Right Now Media, and you just heard a pastor talk about some sort of complex truth, and then you immediately go into your life group and reiterate what they said in a different way that insults people that just heard it because they're not idiots. They just heard what the guy said. Our job as life group leaders is to facilitate a conversation around that specific topic. And so this leader takes people on their journey more often than celebrating the journey of their listeners or their followers. These leaders love to have a platform and think that what they have to share is invaluable, even if it actually isn't that important. These leaders struggle to contextualize their message to a smaller audience. And these leaders believe that their insight is more important than the questions at hand. And so maybe you're in a life group where questions have been presented for you already. Maybe you're a life group leader of one of our middle or high school groups at midweek. And maybe you're already provided questions, but instead of asking the questions that have been provided, you said, you know what, I'm just going to peace out. I'm going to go off the trail and I'm going to ask things that I think need to be asked. And sometimes there's wisdom to that if you're self-aware enough to know where to go. But sometimes the preacher can end up giving more of their insight than actually asking the questions that have been provided to help them go, go really deep. And so something that we like to do, I know Pastor Tom, that's his heart, it's my heart as well. When it comes to life groups, what we want to do is we don't have questions that start out very shallow. Imagine going into the ocean, you're on the sandbar. And then we want to go into the Marianas Trench. And we want to go really deep in the middle questions, really get into the soul, really get into the theology, really get into what you think, believe, and behave. And then question four and five are really kind of coming out of that trench back onto the shore of going, okay, what do we do with this? How does this change the way we live, we think, we believe, we behave? And so, and so those questions are made intentionally for those uh, groups. And, and sometimes preachers just think that what they have to say is better than the questions at hand. And so that's the third type of dark side of a life group leader. So again, we have the passive leader, we have the dominator, and we have the preacher. And the last, the fourth and final dark side of a life group leader, this may be you, is the hypocritical leader, or we might call it the hypothetical leader. Um, and, and this type of leader creates hopeless or resentful followers. This type of leader creates hopeless or resentful followers. This type of leader lays out a lot more action motivated, or they're, they're a lot more action motivated, and they, are, they, they, they challenge people um, that's laced in condemnation, and uh, when it's unfulfilled, they feel that. This leader doesn't go deep, but is very action-oriented, this leader cares more about the movement than the motivation behind the movement or the heart posture. Instead of dwelling on the theology or the heart at first, this leader lays out challenges for their followers to adhere to. And, or another thing that this leader creates is resentment. A lot of people over history have chosen not to follow Jesus, to go to church, to, to, to be in a relationship with God because of being turned away or turned off from him by a hypocritical religious person who's more interested in the rules than they are a relationship with God. And, and here's a thought if you're taking notes. Write this down. 
You cannot lead people where you yourself have not gone. I'll say it one more time. You cannot lead people where you yourself have not gone. And we've all been around a hypocrite. Everybody who's watching this video at home right now or at your workplace or in an office, wherever you are, we've all been around a hypocrite and especially a hypocritical Christian. I love what Mahatma Gandhi says. He says, I love your Christ, but I hate your Christians. What a, what a funny way of saying that sometimes uh, the, the way we live, the way we act, the way we believe and behave is sometimes different than who our Savior is. And so that comes with maturing. But we've all been around a hypocrite. And this leader challenges and pushes towards action, but doesn't actually follow up or hold themselves accountable sometimes to the same standard. This leader may give spiritual wisdom or share opinions that aren't based in truth, but their own personal values are what they heard growing up in their home. This person challenges others to walk faithfully with Jesus, but doesn't do the same themselves. This leader talks the talk, but in their private or personal life does not walk the walk. And maybe as you're watching this video right now, you think maybe that's me. I'm the hypocritical leader. I want to take people where I haven't gone myself. Check this out, guys. This leader mistakes position with authority. This type of leader mistakes position with authority. This leader is the type of leader that leverages their authority, their position, or their title to garnish a following. But check this out. This leader is typically the kind of person that will gain a following quickly, but lose it gradually because the people following this leader realize they aren't really who they say they are under the surface. This leader will never find success until they stop working on others in order to first work on themselves. I'll say that one more time. This leader will never find success until they stop working on others in order to first work on themselves. Now guys, that's the four dark sides of a life group leader and all of us have traits uh, of these leaders within our own leadership styles. Even if you think you're a perfect, awesome guy or girl watching this video right now, I guarantee you there are some dark parts of your heart or your soul that you really haven't addressed fully yet. Because I love what my friend Malik says. He says, we're all, um, we're, we're never fully baked cakes. We're always in the oven. We're always being worked on. And we won't be perfect until the other side of heaven. But to one degree or another, all these dark sides we talked about, right? The passive leader, the dominating leader, the preacher, and the hypocritical or the hypothetical leader. Uh, all four of those dark sides are going to develop bored, disengaged, insulted, helpless, hopeless, and resentful followers. And in our life groups, we all know that we do not want to build bored, disengaged, insulted, helpless, hopeless, and resentful followers or listeners. We want to be the type of leader uh, that is purpose-driven and purposeful. And I'm so excited for you guys to check out part two of this series where Pastor Tom, uh, Tommy D, Tom Daddy is going to kick us off in looking at what we're wanting to build in a life group leader at Charity. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.